And it's recording. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll just wait for a few minutes there to get everybody to um, uh, to basically join up from the last session. Hopefully you're not having any difficulties with the virtual environment. Sometimes uh, virtual private networks and Zoom don't uh, don't work that together all that well. Now, for people in attendance, we're using the Q&A feature at the bottom. Chat is going to be disabled. So please make sure that you use the Q&A, put your questions in. Questions are going to be taken at the end of the presentation. Okay, because I think it's important that, that we allow the individuals to uh, finish a presentation. And then what happens is you can, um, and I'll be fielding the questions and putting them to, uh, to Dr. Leibovitz. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Jay Leibovitz, um, currently executive in residence for public service at the Columbia University's Data Science Institute. Um, and he's going to be talking about expanding the digital talent pipeline in the U.S. government. And remember, like uh, uh, all the previous presentations are coping with talent skills. And people, part of the, the critical part of the uh, capability gaps are people. Now, Jay is basically, he's a prolific author, and he's recently served as the inaugural executive in residence for public service at Columbia University's Data Science Institute. And now he's going to be joining the data analytics program at uh, Tufts University as a professor of practice in the data analytics session. Uh, he served as a full professor previously in the uh, Cary Business School at John Hopkins University, where he was ranked one of the top 10 knowledge management researchers, practitioners, out of 11,000 worldwide and was ranked number two in uh, knowledge management strategy worldwide, according to the Journal of Knowledge Management. For that, prior to joining Hopkins, Dr. Leibovitz was the first knowledge management officer at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And before NASA, Dr. Leibovitz was the Robert W. Deutsch Distinguished Professor of Information Systems at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Professor of Management Science at George Washington University and Chair of Artificial Intelligence at the U.S. Army War College. He's also founding editor-in-chief of the Expert Systems with Applications, an international journal. He also is the series book editor for Data Analytics Applications Book Service Series, Taylor and Francis, as well as a series book editor of the new Digital Transformation Accelerating Organizational Intelligence Book Series, which is being published by the World Scientific Publishing. So without further ado, I would turn the stage over to Dr. Leibovitz. Jay, fantastic that you could take the time to, to speak to us. We're looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wiseman, and uh, welcome everyone. Greetings from Washington, DC, even though I have uh, uh, a shot of uh, Ottawa on the opening screen. So I'm so pleased to be part of this fourth uh, Digital Transformation in Government Conference um, hosted by Dr. Wiseman. In fact, um, Bob is editing a, a volume on digital transformation in government as part of my Digital Transformation book series uh, with World Scientific as the publisher. So this conference is really a, a perfect fit. Uh, I also want to um, express um, our uh, sincere wishes. Um, for, uh, I know uh, in, in Quebec and other parts of Canada, you've been having a tough time with uh, the fires uh, throughout, and we want to wish those families well who have been displaced. Uh, so we, we hope things improve. Well, during this past academic year, uh, my role at Columbia University was um, called the Executive in Residence for Public Service. And the focus was to infuse uh, data analytics into the US federal government and also to help uh, to enhance the digital talent pipeline in the US government. And yesterday we heard from Catherine uh, Luello, who is the CIO from uh, the government of Canada. And she talked also about the importance of, of these areas, particularly how do you 
attract and retain and recruit key talent um, uh, in the data analytics related areas. So today I'd like to talk about some of my experiences in research uh, toward these goals. So firstly, uh, I have always been a strong supporter of Canadian activities as shown in this photo. Uh, this is at the Fulbright Canada main office in Ottawa. Um, and, and I was the Fulbright Visiting Research Chair in Business and Management at Queen's University in Kingston. Uh, in addition to that, my wife uh, graduated from McGill. Um, she wasn't so sure about my being at, at Queen's because of a little bit of rivalry between the two schools, but it worked out fine. So we certainly have some strong uh, Canadian roots. And actually, here back in the US uh, today is uh, Flag Day. So, you know, how fitting is it that I'm speaking today uh, from Washington, D.C. to you all? Uh, I was looking for my um, uh, flag tie, but um, the best I could do was to have the uh, uh, some of the flag colors uh, on my attire. <laughs> Well, just to set the broader perspective, um, one of the research areas that I have pursued uh, deals with developing enterprise-wide strategies for analytics and organizations. And what you see here is um, the business intelligence analytics conceptual framework that I have developed over the recent years and it's based on uh, the literature reviews, my experiences, and uh, a Delphi survey of about 11 uh, key analytics experts worldwide. So what you might notice is uh, you have various business and IT drivers, and um, with the help of various business intelligence enablers, uh, those will lead to your analytic strategy for the organization. And uh, basically you would build out your analytics implementation roadmap uh, and then gauge the success looking at different uh, success measures. So what you see in the red are the ones that the uh, international analytics experts felt were the most important. So I only show this uh, because um, there really hasn't been that I have found a key conceptual framework for trying to develop an enterprise-wide strategy, analytic strategy in organizations. So perhaps in your organization or for those professors, uh, you might try to validate this framework and maybe it will be useful for you. Well, um, I've done a number of surveys, and I'll mention one survey coming up uh, uh, in the next few slides. But one of the questions I had previously asked of those from industry and government uh, was, how would they like to see their analytics improved? And um, as you know, you know, analytics and AI are part of uh, being the digital transformation effort. Of course, it's on the technology end, and we'll be talking uh, coming up about some of the HR, um, the acquisition of skills, and the people in the culture part and process, which is even more important. But anyway, I thought you might find this interesting. And what you see were the most ranked responses. So uh, they certainly would like uh, greater visualization. So uh, you all probably are familiar with uh, Tableau or Power BI, different data visualization packages. But you know, how do you tell a good uh, data story based on the analytics to C-level executives? And visualization plays a key role. And certainly some of the other key responses, you know, how do you deepen an analytics culture among executives? and link uh, to the business plans and key performance indicators. 
Um, I've also have talked with a number of chief analytics officers throughout the country uh, in the U.S. And what they often say is, you know, Jay, I can find all of the applied mathematicians and statisticians uh, that I need. However, I really need analysts who know the business speak and can quickly convey the results to C-level executives. So um, as we look ahead toward trying to develop uh, a digital talent pipeline, um, you know, that's certainly a set of key skills that, that would be important to keep, uh, keep in the forefront. So based on my work this past year, uh, I wanted to highlight some of our research and initiatives that are being considered to infuse data science and analytics into the US government. Um, and back in February, uh, uh, I actually put together an article so you can feel free to reference and take a look at the article in depth. Um, now what's also very exciting is that even uh, it was back in February as well, uh, in the US, there is a Data Science and Literacy Act of 2023, a bill that was introduced uh, by Congress. Um, and the focus is really to increase access to data science education, uh, even going from not just uh, at the two and four year college, uh, you know, age, but even uh, pre-K to 12. So of course, you know, there's been a push for data literacy, but this was also interesting to even focus on trying to um, uh, further educate data science related skills. So we'll see what happens uh, in terms of it uh, you know, being approved through the process. But I thought that was something um, in terms of a good direction for us. So let me um, uh, just mention as part of my gathering effort to better determine the analytics landscape uh, in the U.S. government, we fielded a convenience-based survey to uh, various government agencies um, so mostly federal, there are one or two uh, city governments like Washington DC and New York City. And those who responded are on the screen and it's a pretty diverse group uh, from Social Security Administration to Department of Agriculture to the Environmental Protection Agency, Housing, uh, Archives, et cetera. So there were about 24 agencies in departments. So let me just show you a few of the screens um, in terms of the results, and then I'll uh, summarize the, the full survey results uh, uh, shortly. So out of those who responded, um, about 42% um, were at the senior executive level in the government, with about 48% at the executive level. So again, it, <clears throat> overall, about 90% were uh, executives um, who responded. And um, I'll just highlight <clears throat> uh, a few of the um, uh, a few of the uh, screenshots uh, based on the results. Um, we did ask, for example, uh, to indicate their level of agreement with a series of statements. So, for example, um, about forty four percent of the respondents. Uh, felt neutral on whether their mid-level managers have the skills and confidence to use data to inform their decision making. And this actually seems to be in alignment with um, a number of the talks that, that were given yesterday. And over half um, actually suspect that their internal data quality was, uh, was poor or uh, not you know, cleansed as well as it should be. So um, actually over the recent years, I've been doing research on how well do executives trust their intuition versus uh, analytics. And um, <clears throat> I've worked with Canadian and Polish and Italian colleagues. Uh, and we find 
we have found that experiential learning certainly plays an important role. Let me show you a few more uh, screenshots and then kind of summarize the results on this survey. Uh, we looked at, um, uh, in terms of you know, how could we best enhance uh, the education and training in data science. And again, uh, most of the respondents, albeit senior executives, uh, they were certainly in favor of executive short courses and workshops and certificate programs, uh, lecture webinar series, um, and some of the others to, to enhance their uh, education and training. We also were curious about what are the main barriers to using data science in the government context. And the top three choices were um, difficulty due to data silos. So again, this lack of interoperability, which keeps surfacing, and we've heard that in a number of talks already, uh, about 74% had indicated that difficulty. 70% uh, indicated the difficulty of hiring and training staff with data science capacity. And then um, uh, the next highest was the difficulty of accessing relevant data sources. So um, uh, we, we then asked a series of questions about their uh, business and soft skills, technical skills and analytic skills. And, um, and so in terms of the analytic skills, the ones that the executives uh, felt most comfortable, uh, dealt with uh, visualization and dashboard design, um, and then even use of the analytics tools. Um, and those skill sets that they felt least competent as expected, uh, dealt with AI uh, and deep learning and some of the big data technologies and machine learning algorithms. So just to summarize uh, from the full set of questions, um, I just showed you a subset. Uh, the the mid-level managers uh, certainly did feel that um, they need some better skills and confidence uh, in terms of applying data and evidence to inform their decision making. Uh, not every department uh, you know, had that analytic talent. Um, and as mentioned previously, you know, just sharing data across departments and the silo effect uh, is still an issue. Um, and the respondents uh, did indicate they do rely more on data than their intuition. But again, about one third of the respondents felt that their internal data quality was suspect. Uh, about 88 percent. Uh, so most people were aware that there is a new data scientist position in the federal uh, government, in the U.S. government, as of December 2021. So that was encouraging. Um, they certainly were, you know, interested in enhancing their data science skills, as, as I mentioned previously. In terms of the most used types of data in their organizations, uh, they refer to official government statistics and open data. Uh, we also asked what are some of the main data analysis skills that they use and um, various statistical analyses like linear regression uh, was used, uh, data mining, uh, and uh, a fair amount of uh, spatial analysis uh, and GIS analytics, uh, geographic information systems analytics. We also asked about where are they seeing data science being most used in the government? So for policy, uh, policing and public uh, safety, uh, transportation seem to uh, be quite active in applying data science techniques. Uh, also, we asked about what is um, kind of their confidence uh, and competency and skill sets in uh, again, uh, most felt comfortable with Excel and uh, dashboarding, um, uh, SQL databases. I'm surprised with R and Python, but um, that's usually for more heavy core data science folks. But, but anyway, uh, you know, interesting to hear. And then certainly um, 
they would like to, you know, encourage training programs for staff and um, uh, believe strongly in having data sharing agreements with other government agencies. And again, the main barrier um, uh, to using data science uh, was trying to have the, the right talent in place, as well as the interoperability uh, uh, issues in the data siloing. So uh, the last set of questions actually looked at uh, the business and soft skills, as well as technical and analytic skills. So from the business and soft skills side, most of the respondents felt comfortable uh, in terms of you know, picking up uh, uh, new things, so learning how to learn so they could learn quickly, uh, their communication and presentation skills, they felt confident in seeing the, the full picture and critical thinking. So again, no real surprises here. Uh, for the technical skills, um, they felt most comfortable in data reporting and, and, and telling a good story based on the data and proactive problem solving. Um, again, they, they didn't feel quite as comfortable on, on the more technical skills on database design and, and related skill sets, which again, you would expect. Uh, and then on the analytic side, uh, again, they most felt comfortable with uh, applying some of the dashboarding and some of the basic analytics tool sets. And for the more sophisticated ones, uh, of course, um, uh, they would have others do that. Okay, so uh, based on, on the survey results, um, we are uh, considering a number of different initiatives that um, would help further uh, enhance the federal executives uh, capabilities in the analytics area, as well as to try to develop a uh, more complete digital talent pipeline in the government. So these are a few of the initiatives uh, that uh, are being considered. The first is a federal executive boot camp on what we were calling decision intelligence, again, to bring in how data and evidence-based reasoning can better inform um, one's decision-making capabilities at the executive level. Uh, we had planned back in April to have a half-day virtual data science and U.S. government day, where the focus would be on uh, data science education uh, in the government. We had to postpone it, um, so hopefully that will that will happen uh, in, in the coming months. Um, the third bullet uh, looks at uh, the need to having a clearinghouse on uh, different opportunities for students and faculty to pursue and help uh, the US government in the, in the data science uh, analytics area. Uh, right now, it was very, it's very difficult to find all the opportunities that are available uh, throughout the government in this regard and with partner organizations. Um, and so I know there is some work um, being proposed by the Partnership for Public Service, uh, which is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization in Washington, uh, geared for federal executive education primarily. But um, they, I know we're talking about perhaps serving in that role as the clearinghouse because from um, we, we conducted about 35 follow-up interviews after our surveys, and, and it's just very hard for people to find out what are the different opportunities, actually, which are, there, there are quite a few that are available. And certainly, we could have various capstone projects with federal agencies for uh, students in data science programs, um, gogovernment.org. Um, uh, has been set up, and it would be nice to feature kind of testimonials uh, of data scientists in the government. Uh, we could have ver various data science and practice podcasts, uh, and even develop a whole online community of uh, uh, practice uh, around data scientists uh, in the government, and so borrowing from my knowledge management background. 
So to help in, in this regard, um, I've also been involved in trying to um, uh, collect um, different ideas and thoughts to how best to move things forward. And actually, um, uh, in August, August 16th uh, is the publication date. Uh, there's a new book uh, called Pivoting Government Through Digital Transformation. And it's um, a book I put together with international contributors and uh, to look at some of these issues. So I'm hoping this might be useful in the future. Well, let's now take a look to see what's available for data scientists in the US government. So as I mentioned previously, uh, there is a new data science series, um, which was created uh, in 2021. So previously, um, you would have to come in as a operations research or a business analyst, of which the salaries were a little lower and, and it didn't the job descriptions didn't quite match uh, those as a data scientist. So this is uh, an excellent you know, start uh, to try to encourage more people uh, to come into the government in data science uh, types of roles. As you know, the tech industry uh, you know, is having some tough times, um, uh, certainly in the US. And so uh, one initiative too is to bring some of the, these talented uh, industry folks uh, from the data science, analytics, AI areas to work with the government. Um, and, um, and so that's an interesting direction too. So there's some initiatives to facilitate uh, making that happen. And uh, just as an example, the US Department of State um, was looking for many data scientists uh, full time, so um, so you know there there's some interesting work and opportunities in this area. Uh, also, back in 2021, the uh, there was the U.S. Digital Core Fellowships for Early Career Technologists. Uh, you have to be a U.S. citizen, but these are two year programs. Um, fellowship programs where you get placed with a government agency and you do work uh, in the in the data science analytics area. So again, a nice opportunity for um, building out your talent in the um, uh, in the data science area. Well, uh, you might be familiar with uh, what's called the Evidence Act in the US and part of that act, was to establish the role of a chief data officer uh, in the various government, uh, US government agencies and departments. So um, uh, back in November of this past year, a survey uh, was, uh, was taken of federal chief data officers. And I just wanna show you uh, some of the results and recommendations for the future. So this was a survey done by the Data Foundation uh, based in Washington and, and GuideHouse, uh, which is a um, consulting group. So um, I won't highlight in the interest of time the findings, but the recommendations down below are that Congress uh, really needs to further increase the chief data officer's funding flexibilities and provide more direct resources to the CDOs. Um, uh, they felt that they're not being resourced uh, as well as they need to be to be successful in their role. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget, uh, as part of uh, uh, the White House, should require uh, guidance to the chief data officers to clarify responsibilities and enable the full implementation of the Open Government Data Act. Uh, also, it was recommended that Congress should create a federal chief data officer um, uh, as the senior executive level position uh, for the U.S. Uh, there is the U.S. chief data scientist um, uh, position that has been created over over the recent years, 
And uh, the thought was to have also the creation of a federal chief data officer um, to kind of steer uh, uh, the other CDOs and, and represent them as well. And then certainly to remove the statutory sunset for the council. So I was curious to see, um, you know, what in looking ahead for data science opportunities, uh, what's being predicted? Uh, and in the U.S., the U.S. Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics, uh, they publish an occupational outlook handbook. And um, uh, and so uh, I'm looking at the job outlook uh, below, and they estimate that the employment of data scientists is projected to grow at 36% uh, from 2021 to 2031, uh, which is much faster than the average for all occupations. And um, they even indicate the number of openings, which I think is very underestimated uh, in my opinion. But certainly you see there is uh, an opportunity for tremendous uh, growth uh, for uh, hiring um, uh, uh, data scientists uh, in the coming years. So this is a little bit of an eye chart, but all I wanted to indicate is that there are many um, opportunities uh, across different organizations um, uh, affiliated with the government um, to expand further education and training and employment in analytics, AI, and related areas. So uh, part of the challenge is knowing <laughs> what's available. And, and so that's why a clearinghouse idea, I think, is a good one. Now, to further, um, to further uh, understand the opportunities available for analytics in the government, a great initiative was created by, it's called uh, New America, and it's called this, the Public Interest Technology Program. And as part of that program, there is a university network. Uh, I'll show you the members. There are currently uh, 58 members. Um, all are US-based except for three universities in uh, Scotland, Croatia, and Hungary. And um, actually, Columbia University is, uh, is one of the members. But the focus, again, is to try to foster collaboration between universities and colleges to build the field of public interest technology and to nurture this new generation of civic-minded technologists. So it's a wonderful initiative. Uh, these are the uh, member institutions. And again, you're not limited uh, to just those in the US. If you're interested, I'm happy to put you in contact uh, with the head of, uh, of uh, Pitt UN. Uh, but again, uh, it's a great uh, opportunity for building out data analytics talent uh, uh, and get people interested in working with the government. Well, back uh, in May last month, the Data Foundation held its 2023 research symposium on data and evidence for better government. And the bottom line is that we still have uh, some, we've made some good strides, but there's still a ways to go. And uh, I know in November coming up, uh, they will host the, the Gov Data X conference, uh, will be held in Washington, I think it's November 7th of this year to again, uh, look at better ways to um, build out talent uh, in, in, uh, in, in these areas. So even though I'm a big fan of data and evidence and analytics and AI, I mentioned that I really do feel that experiential learning, and many of you are executives, and I'm sure you apply your experiential learning and your intuitive awareness in addition to your data informed you know reasoning and uh actually um along those lines uh i have a book coming out called developing the intuitive executive 
uh, using analytics <clears throat> and intuition for success. Um, that will be out in the fall. But this is a book that some of my colleagues uh, at Columbia um, uh, wrote over this past year. It's called Decimals Over, uh, I'm sorry, Decisions Over Decimals. And they talk about uh, what they call quantitative intuition. Uh, I call it informed intuition or rational intuition. But again, how do you best uh, complement uh, your analytic skill sets with building your intuitive awareness over time? So, um, so I was also interested too in the US looking at kind of the market to see you know, what are some of the hiring plans uh, for companies at least um, in the data science analytics area. And uh, of course, as I mentioned, the tech sector has been hit hard this year, which um, does create a great opportunity for, for those um, who might be out of work from industry, you know, to, to bring them into the government. So um, this is uh, a sample of 150 companies. Uh, this was back in January. They were looking at the first and second uh, quarters uh, hiring plans, and um, uh, about 51% were holding steady in terms of uh, trying to um, further develop uh, data science talent. About 25% were growing. Um, uh, well, the bottom line is, especially because of it's a tough time right now for the tech industry, but there seems to be you know, some potential growth um, for, for hiring in the data science analytics area, even though we're being constrained a bit, a bit by some of the recession. Another important area that, that we've seen um, <laughs> uh, over the past uh, year, particularly, uh, is the impact of AI and how that uh, will be important as you build out skill sets uh, in, in the technology areas to assist with digital transformation efforts. So you could see on the screen uh, what Gartner predicts uh, in terms of uh, decisions that will be at least partially automated by AI. Uh, we already have seen uh, various AI-powered software. So OpenAI's uh, ChatGPT, uh, Google has Bard, uh, there's Forever Voices, um, and these are already impacting society. Uh, I found some interesting statistics. Uh, since March of 2023, ChatGPT generates 1.8 billion visitors per month. And, um, and now the newest, the hottest AI job uh, is called the AI Prompt Engineer. And I saw a recent ad. Uh, they were offering salaries from 250000 to 350000 for these positions, a whole field of prompt engineering that's looking at this ge generative AI, large language models uh, field. And um, so you'll hear more about this in, in the coming years, I'm sure. So um, Europe has the AI uh, Act. Uh, the, in the US, the White House has the blueprint for uh, uh, an AI Bill of Rights uh, as of 2023. And uh, within the White House blueprint uh, AI Bill of Rights, there are six key tenants for responsible AI, which we must keep in mind. They include human rights, uh, human oversight, explainable use of AI, security, safety, and reliability, uh, personal privacy, and equity and inclusion. So we're going to see more uh, about the use of AI uh, in, in uh, the government as well as in industry and beyond. So let me just finish up with um, one last, uh, last study uh, that I was involved in. Uh, one of my students, Akil Baskar, um, uh, help put this together. And we were very interested in looking at what are the skill sets that are needed for business analytics professionals um, uh, versus data scientists. 
And um, at the university level, we found that many people uh, are a bit confused about whether heading the more kind of computer science data scientist route or more of the business uh, kind of intermediary um, uh, business analytics route. Um, so uh, you could take a look at this article. There's also a spreadsheet model that we built in that you can access that will help you decide whether to head the business analytics route, the data scientist route, or, or neither. So we uncovered about 51 skill sets that were clustered around a business and soft skills, technical skills, and analytic skills. And uh, I know I'm running short on time, so I'll, I'll go through this really quickly. Um, the red refers to business analytics skills. Uh, the green is for data scientist skills, and the purple is for both. And the importance of transferable skills like uh, analytical thinking, creative thinking, uh, resilience, flexibility, agility, communication skills, and others were certainly the it were key skill sets for both uh, professions. In fact, um, the May 2023 World Economic Forum's Future of Work report, they highlight the top skill sets for 2030 being analytical thinking, creative thinking, and resilience. So um, uh, I won't go through this in, in depth um, uh, because you can always refer to the article, but the bottom line um, as we kind of work through this is that the, the um, aha moment for us was that even those who wanted to go the business analytics professional route, they were expected to have many more technical skills than we originally uh, imagined. So again, you, you might want to refer back to this article to look at possible skill sets needed as we move forward for digital transformation efforts um, going forward. So let me close um, by saying that there really are many opportunities to help infuse data analytics into the federal government in the US uh, and to further enhance the digital talent uh, in the government. So certainly digital transformation will continue to be important uh, as noted by uh, my relatively new book series in this area. Um, but in addition, further educating federal executives and applying data and evidence along with their experiential learning will also be critical for making informed decisions. So certainly we still need to deepen the analytics culture in the government. We need to further address the concerns of the federal chief data officers to be sure that they're properly resourced uh, to carry out their missions but uh, I'm very you know, optimistic. It's certainly exciting times ahead. And uh, for those interested, um, uh, these are some books that uh, might put you, if you have problems sleeping at night, you can take a look at them. But uh, we do have a, a book called The Digital Transformation Demystified, uh, which was written by Dr. Frank Granato from the Institute of Digital Transformation. And that's a good introduction for those who might be less familiar with, with uh, digital transformation. We're certainly looking forward to Dr. Wiseman's book um, uh, as he puts it together, looking at digital transformation in the government. So I'm going to stop here and I want to thank you for your time and um, I'm happy to answer any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you again. Okay, folks. Well, thank you very much, Jay. That was a great presentation, and it's certainly near and dear to my, to my heart, having worked in that area for decades. So it's it's uh, it's there are an incredible number of obstacles and challenges. So I've got some questions for you. Uh, the first question is: What are your thoughts on initiatives such as Google's data science educational certificate programs? And would they and would these certificates, uh, for example, from this Google? Um, uh, education certificate program meet entry-level requirements for government? Yeah, so excellent question. And 
And what you're seeing now um, are, you know, different uh, companies um, who are offering um, uh, data science or analytics programs or certificate programs or credentialing programs. And I think it's good. So, I mean, um, uh, Google's data science uh, uh, program, I, you know, is, uh, is, is one that I think is uh, solid. Um, you know, it's important to get credentialed in some way. Um, of course, being at the university, you know, we, we always try to encourage um, uh, most of our programs. And we heard yesterday from the University of Ottawa with the DTI program and the business uh, technology management programs. We often have certificate programs where you can pick up four or five key courses uh, which will help you. And then, you know, for those who want to go on for, let's say, a master's program, you could apply those courses as, as part of that program. So um, there are a lot of different organizations in New York City. Uh, there's the Data Science Academy, which is even geared for um, uh, high school students uh, to pick up skills, you know, more skill sets in, in the data science analytics area. So, um, uh, so I think there are, um, you know, uh, a number of opportunities, uh, at, you know, such as Google's uh, data science uh, program. Um, but of course, we, we always encourage, um, you know, our students to, to explore even certificate programs along those lines uh, at the university. I think I think that's great. Like you're talking about skills and knowledge, and what happens is the you know certain certificate programs will give you some skills, but they might be transient. Whereas you need the deep seated knowledge to be able to handle a myriad of uh, skill sets and tools and the like. Um, we have an interesting question, and it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, is is right now having a chief information officer and a chief data officer? Um, I know there's some interesting challenges on that. Would you like to comment on how do you differentiate between these roles uh, for that? Thank you. That's a great question. And, and, and we're seeing certainly the, the chief digital officer, the chief digital transformation officer. Previously, we had the chief innovation officer. So, um, so the, the way I look at it, um, is um, uh, and in the government in the U.S. Uh, so you have both certainly the CIO, Chief Information Officer, and the CDO, Chief Data Officer. So I think the CIO um, has a um, uh, a larger um, uh, portfolio, let's say, or or if I were to have uh, the CDO. Uh, you know, might report then to to the CIO uh, because the the chief data officer is really involved with looking at the data um, uh, governance issues, uh, looking at, at data management, looking at building out uh, opportunities for uh, for those uh, to be able to apply the data to make you know informed decisions in spearheading. Uh, that that data governance area. So uh, the CIO for me um, has a little broader uh, charter, um, uh, which looks at um, you know at, as we've heard from the first talk today from India Rail, um, uh, looking at a number of issues um, uh, that that do encompass you know some of the issues, of course, relating to security. Uh, and certainly data security is also key, a key role to play, even, you know, for the CDO as well. So, um, uh, so that's how I would distinguish the two. Uh, the CIO has a broader, uh, looking at the IT infrastructure, uh, a much broader uh, uh, obligation in that regard, you know, as compared to the more focused data governance uh, uh, data architecture, um, uh, data, you know, types of roles that, that the CDO would play. Thanks, Jay. And 
if I might just put a footnote to that, I was there when they established the CIO positions uh, back in the early 90s, 1990s. I'm dating myself. Well, I'm already dating myself with my white hair. But the, uh, but the issue is uh, I was in strategic direction. And at that time, CIO was in charge, was basically acting as the chief data officer, the chief innovation officer, was the initial role and concept of ops operations was uh, innovation, knowledge management, artificial intelligence. It, it was meant, that was back in the 1990s. It evolved into sort of a chief technology officer role because of the platforms issues and all that sort of stuff and the complexity. And uh, now, and that's one reason in the Canadian government that differentiated information management from information technology. There's been this IMIT. So this, this is going to evolve. And uh, I, I like what you said is basically the CIO should have a CDO reporting to him as well as a CTO and basically take a look at the advanced analytics and the like, okay, for that. So um, good, uh, we've, got another, um, we've got another question. Uh, would you consider NASA as being the gold standard for knowledge management? And what organizations do you consider world leaders? Yeah, so I, I've worked with NASA over the years, and they have a federated approach to knowledge management. There are 10 NASA centers throughout the, the country. Um, there's a chief knowledge officer um, uh, at NASA headquarters, and then there's also an equivalent, either knowledge management officer or chief knowledge officer at each of the NASA centers. But each center has its own culture. So, so there's an overarching set of uh, kind of shared views on uh, knowledge management for NASA as an agency. But again, each particular uh, center, whether it's uh, Johnson Space Center in charge of uh, you know, down in Houston or Kennedy Space Center, or uh, I worked outside of Washington uh, at NASA Goddard Space, at Space Center involved with satellite missions. Uh, they each have their own culture and, and specific roles. So uh, the long-winded answer is, I think NASA is certainly uh, at, for, for the government, um, a, a key leader in knowledge management, I mean, the military has been involved in knowledge management over many, many years, uh, just with after action reviews and, uh, you know, learning from uh, failures. And, and so um, uh, a lot of that has been built into the, the military uh, fabric. Um, uh, so, uh, and then worldwide, a lot of companies, uh, I, I would say the best resource would be to look at um, it's called APQC, uh, the American Productivity Quality Center, APQC. They're based in Houston, and they do a lot of KM benchmarking, uh, looking not only at government agencies, but industry as well. And they have a number of reports um, that will probably help you in that regard. Okay, great. And uh, we got... Um... Another one. Uh, can you just give a synopsis of the top five must-read books on knowledge for any for busy executives on knowledge management? <laughs> My series, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah. I might be a little biased, but um, I'll give you a few books. Uh, one of my colleagues, Tom Davenport, uh, has written. Uh, a number of books over the years. He's he's one of the key thought leaders in the information management, uh, you know, knowledge management fields. Uh, and he's written books. Uh, um, uh, the one of the early books was by Larry Prusak uh, and and Tom Davenport, um, P R U S A K, looking at. Um, forget the exact title, but um, uh, it was essentially kind of an industry view of, of knowledge management. Uh, Tom wrote books looking at competing with analytics. Um, uh, and then I actually had the first uh, book and handbook of knowledge management. And we had a second edition that came out. Um, it's called Knowledge Management Handbook Collaboration and Networking, Social Networking. And I'll just mention one other book, um, which might be 
even more useful. Uh, I edited a, a, a book of colleagues from um, contributors from throughout the world. Uh, in fact, um, uh, the chief knowledge officer from NASA has a chapter. The book's called Successes and Failures in Knowledge Management. And uh, it came out, it's by, um, uh, I think came out in 2016. And um, uh, that kind of presents different case studies of things that worked and things that didn't. And it's really geared for the business professional uh, to learn from the insights of these chief knowledge officers and others. So that might be useful too. But you know, feel free to send me an email and I'm happy to uh, provide you know more specific guidance. I'd also like to uh, plug um, last time I was in government, I went back on exchange and um, I was using the books written by Dr. Kenneth Balk, uh, Dalkir, and that's by MIT. She'll be giving two presentations tomorrow on knowledge management in a post-truth world, and then there's another one on future trends in knowledge management. And um, I would really recommend it. It's going on to the fourth, uh, it's, it's going on to the fourth edition and it's being published by uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She is a professor and head of the Information Sciences School over at um, McGill University in Montreal. Yeah, and Bob, just to interject, uh, I know Kim as well, and I agree. Uh, her KM book is is excellent. I worked with Kim um, uh, a few years ago at McGill, and so uh, that's certainly uh, that's certainly a good one as well. Okay, super. Uh, one last question. Uh, do you recommend the Knowledge Management Institute provides online courses, certifications, and resources on knowledge management? Yeah, that's sort of a private sector um, endorsement or not. Um, it's, anyways, just we so I, get into a thumbs up, thumbs down on a private sector company, but yeah. we can just give a general comment. Go ahead, please, uh, Jay. Yeah, so I know Doug Widener, who uh, runs the KM Institute, and I know they've had uh, many programs worldwide throughout the years to um, uh, try to certify knowledge managers. And um, um, so I, I know they've been you know, very active over the years in that role. Um, uh, so you know, I, it, it's always good to explore, uh, you know, investigate all, all options. And, um, but I know they, they've been um, quite active in that role. Okay, thank you. Um, just just one other thing that you might want to take a look at. I know a lot of you are from uh, participants, attendees are from government. Uh, you might want to take a look at uh, in the military and NATO. It's not by accident. They call it shared situational awareness. And as a consequence, they share data very well. Okay. Uh, knowledge, not too bad, but some of the new nations, and we'll be talking with uh, uh, Ott Delsberg. He's the um, one of the newer NATO members from Estonia. And, um, you know, like I said, it's not by accident that some 30 nations can work on the field without uh, getting into serious problems with one another. Okay, so um, defense has got some, and I think a lot of this is uh, public knowledge, so you can basically uh, access that uh, as well. So anyways, Jay, that was a fascinating presentation. Thank you ever so much. And um, I'd like to basically, you know, say on behalf of all the attendees, thank you for taking the time out of your extremely busy schedule <laughs> to basically not only uh, participate and present, but also attend uh, the subject areas. And um, I hope that you've gotten something out of this. And I know that all the attendees have gotten a great deal out of your presentation. And just one aside is from an education point of view, the talent stream, uh, cybersecurity is also one that is incredibly short of people, not just data science, but cybersecurity. So students that are listening to this, um, you know, get your data science, but understand the security implications of that. Because data security, uh, information security is an absolute key item uh, for that, for any digital transformation. Without further ado, I say thank you very much, folks. It's time for a coffee break. And then at 10.10, uh, we'll be starting our next session. And that's going to be with, um, sorry, get those sessions. Yeah, that's going to be Ott Velsberg, the Chief Data Officer uh, for Estonia. And he, he's got a, 
he's got a fascinating um, uh, presentation on basically uh, basic uh, give and building a data driven government. Okay, so anyways, I'll see you at ten ten. Thank you very much, Jay. We're much appreciated. Take care. Later. Thanks, okay. Bob. Thanks, everybody.